Good afternoon, fifth grade. It's Mrs. Utsi, ready to read you another chapter from the Watsons Go to Birmingham. We are ready for chapter six today, so here we go. Chapter six, Swedish creams and welfare cheese. Mama stuck her head into the living room and said, Byron, I want you and Kenny to go up to Mitchell's and get some milk, a loaf of bread, and a can of tomato paste for dinner. She waved a little piece of paper at us that had the grocery list written on it. How come Kenny can't go by himself? Byron, I want a half gallon of milk, a loaf of bread, and a small can of tomato paste. If you asked Mama why you had to do something and she didn't feel like explaining, she just repeated herself. She was chopping up onions for spaghetti sauce, and I guess the tears made it so she didn't feel like talking. If you were stupid enough to ask your question again, there would be the loudest quiet in the world coming from Mama. If you went totally crazy and asked the question a third time, you might as well tie yourself to a tree and say, ready, aim, fire. Byron got the message and jerked up off the couch and walked over to the TV and punched the off knob. I knew this wasn't going to be a fun walk up to Mitchell's. We went into the kitchen. Give me the money. Just sign for it. Just what? Just tell Mr. Mitchell you want to sign for it. Mama kept whacking the onions. What? Just go in there and tell Mr. Mitchell I want to sign for some food? Your daddy and me made all the arrangements last weekend, Byron. Mr. Mitchell will let us sign for groceries until payday. Lots of people do it. A half gallon of milk, a loaf of bread, and a small can of tomato paste. Mama started chopping the onions a little harder. So I ain't got to give them no cash? Whack, whack, whack. All of a sudden, Byron's face jumped like a bell went off in his head. Wait a minute. I know what this means. We on welfare, ain't we? I held my breath. If I found out we were on welfare, I was going to really have to get ready to be teased. No, we're not on welfare. I can't believe it. You really going to start serving welfare food in this house? You really going to make me go embarrass myself by signing a welfare list for some groceries like a blamed peon? I guess Bai hadn't been counting how many times Mama had repeated herself. She smacked the knife on the kitchen counter and jumped right up in Bai's face. Listen here, Mr. High and Mighty. Since you just got to know, food is food. You've eaten welfare food in this house before, and if I need be, you'll eat it again. Don't come playing that nonsense with me. I already told you, this is not welfare food. You've got about five seconds to have that door hit you in the back. Kenny, move. Bai pouted and walked real fast up to Mitchell, so I had to kind of run along to keep up with him. He didn't say anything while we got the stuff Mama wanted. He just snatched the things off the shelves. Then he dropped the bomb on me. You go get in line and hold our spot. I'm going to look at some comics for a minute. When you get up to the register, I'll come and tell them how we're going to pay. Oh, man, I knew what that meant. Bye figured out a way not to get embarrassed. He was going to hide until after I signed for the groceries. I was going to be the one who got embarrassed. I couldn't argue or anything, so now it was me who was pouting. Byron disappeared around the comic book rack. Hi, Kenny. Hi, Mr. Mitchell. This all you want? Uh-huh. He took the groceries and rang them up on the cash register. That's a dollar and 23 cents. I saw Bai's head come peeking around the comics. Uh, this has got to go on the welfare list, I said kind of quiet. Mr. Mitchell twisted his face up. On the what? I said real low so only Mr. Mitchell could hear. We just found out we got put on welfare, and we've got to sign this food up on the welfare list. Byron's head disappeared again. Mr. Mitchell laughed. Kenny, this isn't a welfare list. This means your daddy's going to pay all at once instead of a few times every week. Really? Mr. Mitchell reached under the counter and opened up a little brown box. He pulled out a bunch of yellow cards, and I could see Watson was written on the top of one of them. He wrote $1.23 on the first line and said, sign here, then pointed to a spot next to the $1.23. I wrote Kenneth Watson and gave him back the pen. That's it? That's it. He put the groceries in a brown paper bag and handed them to me. 
See you, Mr. Mitchell. The second I walked out the store, Byron was next to me and he was in a lot better mood. Man, I can't believe it. We just had a chance to get a bag full of free food and all we took was some stupid milk, a loaf of bread, and a can of tomato sauce. Byron's good mood started getting to me too. He was smiling and even put his arm around my shoulder as we walked. I couldn't help myself. It felt so grown up to have Bai walking with me like that. I started laughing right along with him. His mood was so much better that he even took the bag of groceries from me. Most of the time when Mama made us go to Mitchell's, Byron would make me carry the bags from the store right up to the front porch. Then he'd take them from me so Mama would think he carried them the whole way. But now he started carrying them four blocks away from home. This is just too much. All you got to do is sign that stupid card and that old fool Mitchell will give you what you want. Too, too much. Now that Bai was happy, I had two questions I wanted to ask him. First, he said a word that I'd never heard before, and since he said it in front of Mama, I knew it wasn't cussing. As we walked home with his arm around my shoulder, I thought I might get a real answer from him. Byron, what's a peon? A peon? Didn't you see the Magnificent Seven? Peons was them folks that were so poor that the rich folks would just as soon pee on them as anything else. I knew this had to be a lie. You could get yourself in a lot of trouble if you listen to half the stuff Byron said. But I asked my next question anyway. What do you think the welfare food was that Mama said she gave us? I wish I hadn't asked because this brought back his bad mood. He took his arm from around my shoulder and said, I know what it was. He handed me back the groceries too. Don't you remember how some of the time dad sneaks up in the morning and goes in the kitchen and when he comes out, there's a big jug of milk? Ain't you ever wondered where that milk come from? You ever seen any udders on dad? That milk come out of one of them big brown boxes they keep up on them high shelves. Pure D welfare food. And don't you remember that cheese? Who ever heard of cheese coming in a box as, box as big as a loaf of bread? You ever try to pick one of them things up? Real cheese comes in hunks or slices, not no blange loaves that weigh 40 pounds. I always thought there was something strange about that mess, and now I know. She been sneaking us welfare food. Pure D welfare food. The cheese tasted okay to me, and except for a big powdery lump every once in a while, Dad's milk was all right, too. But to try to get Byron back into his good mood, I acted real disgusted and said, Oh, man! A week later, I was walking in the alley behind Mitchell's when a big cookie with pink frosting just about hit me in the head. It went by like a little flying saucer, then crashed in the dirt. I looked all around and didn't see anybody, so I put my hands over my face and stood still because I knew if something weird like this happened once, it usually happened again. Sure enough, another cookie hit me right in the back and a big laugh came out of the green apple tree. Byron. He dropped out of the tree like a superhero. He had a great big bag of cookies in one hand and a green apple with a giant bite out of it in the other. Want some? Bai tipped a bag of Swedish cream cookies at me. I knew this was a trick. The bag must have been empty, but I looked inside anyway. There was still a half a bag of cookies. Thanks. I grabbed two of the cookies and looked at them real good in case Bai had put bugs or something on them. They were clean, but I kept waiting for the trick. Why would Byron waste four good cookies on me? Man, Swedish creams have got to be the best cookies in the world. I gulped them down and wiped my hands on my pants. I couldn't believe it. Bye tipped the bag at me again. He jumped up and snatched a green apple off the tree, checked it for worm holes, then handed it to me. You best eat some of this. Them Swedish creams is good at first, but they get kind of thick in your throat after a while. Byron was being too nice, so I knew something bad was about to happen. Then I noticed a crumpled up Swedish creams bag on the ground next to the tree, and I could figure out why he was being so generous. He'd already eaten a bag and a half. A bell went off in my head. 
I knew now why he'd been so excited and happy when he found out about getting free food at Mitchell's. Bob was signing up for stuff that Mama and Dad didn't even know about. It was like he read my mind, cause I just, cause I was just about to say, "Ooh, bye," when he stopped being friendly and crossed his eyes at me and said, "Don't even think about it, Point Dexter. You ate two of them yourself, so quit wasting my cookies and just shut up and enjoy what's left." He tipped the bag at me again. He had me. I couldn't tell on him or else I'd be in just as much trouble as he would. I took another one. Bai went over to the green apple tree and slid his back against it until he was sitting down. I did the same thing right next to him and we sat together munching. I wasn't used to being this friendly with Byron, so I guess I was kind of nervous and didn't really know what we should talk about. Bai just sat there chomping down apples. So I tried to think what him and Bubhead would talk about when they sat around like this. Finally, I said, so bye, how about you and me doing a little cussing? He twisted up his face and said, I thought I told you your jive little ass to shut the hell up and enjoy the damn cookies. Now do it. I got a huge smile. This was a perfect day. But like always, bye ruined it. Look. He pointed up at a telephone wire where a big bird sat. The bird was about the size of a pigeon and was grayish brown with a long pointy tail hanging underneath it. Bai jumped up and said, that's a morning dove. They're the coolest birds in the world. Don't nothing shake them up. Bai threw a Swedish cream at it. The cookie zipped right by the bird's head and all the bird did was raise its wings once and look behind it. He threw three more cookies at the bird, and it still didn't move. When Byron's four Swedish cream left his hand, I knew that if the bird didn't move, he was going to get whacked. The cookie popped the bird smack jab in the chest. The bird's wings both stuck out to the side, and for a hot second with its tail hanging down and its wings sticking out like that, it looked like a perfect small letter T stuck up on the telephone wire. Then in slow motion, the bird leaned back and crashed to the dirt of the alley behind Mitchell's. I've been throwing rocks and things at birds since I was born and had never even come close to hitting one. I've seen a million people throw a million things at birds and no one had ever really hit one, not even a pigeon. But now, Bai had knocked a bird right out of the sky with a Swedish cream cookie. When I got to Byron, he picked up the bird and was holding it in his hand. The bird's head drooped backwards and was rolling from side to side, dead as a donut. You got him! You got a bird! Byron held the bird in one hand and with his other one gently brushed pink frosting off the dove's chest. You got him! I've never seen a bird get... I looked right at Bai and his face was all twisted up and his eyes were kind of shut. He dropped the bird, walked over to the green apple tree and started throwing up. I stood there with my mouth open. I couldn't believe Byron was starting to cry. And I couldn't believe how much vomit a bag and a half of Swedish creams and some green apples could make. When it looked like he was done, I walked over and put my hand on his back. As soon as I touched him, he popped me in the arm hard. Bye, what? He picked up a rotten apple and threw it at me. Get the hell out of here. What you staring at? Them apples got me sick, you little cross-eyed punk. Get out of here. Rotten apples started coming at me real hard and fast, so I left. It was hard to understand what was going on with Byron. Some of the time, if a genie came and gave you three wishes, you wouldn't mind using all three of them to wish some real bad stuff on them. Not stupid things like that woman in the fairy tale when she wished her husband had a sausage on his nose, either. I mean, stuff that would make Byron hurt so much that he'd have to think every day about how mean he is. If he just had a sausage growing off of his nose, people might laugh at him behind his back, but no one would have nerve enough to tease him to face to his face and call him weenie nose or something. He wouldn't know how it feels to always have someone jumping on you. How sad that can make you get. Sometimes I hated him that much and I thought he was the meanest person in the world. 
After my arm quit hurting from his punch, I went back to the alley behind Mitchell's to take another look at the dead bird, but it was gone. Right in the spot where the bird had crashed, Bai had dug a little grave. And on top of the grave, there were two popsicle sticks tied together and across. Leave it to Daddy Cool to kill a bird, then give it a funeral. Leave it to Daddy Cool to torture human kids at school all day long and never have his conscience bother him, but to feel sorry for a stupid little, stupid little grayish brown bird. I don't know. I really wish I was as smart as some people thought I was. Because some of the time, it was real hard to understand what was going on with Byron. I think we'll go ahead and jump into chapter seven today, too. So I'm going to continue reading. Chapter seven. Every chihuahua in America lines up to take a bite out of Byron. I was sitting at the kitchen table doing homework and watching Mama make dinner when Byron came in through the back door. He was surprised we were there because as soon as he saw us, he turned around and tried to walk right back out. Both me and Mama smelled a rat. Byron, Mama said, what have I told you about wearing that hat in this house? Oh yeah, I was just going right back. He pushed the screen door open again. Wait a minute. Byron was trapped in the doorway with his right foot in and his left foot out. Come here. Mama put down the knife she had been peeling potatoes with and wiped her hands on a dish towel. Byron's inside foot joined his outside one in trying to get away. Uh, I'll be back in a minute. They're waiting for me down at Byron Watson. You take off that hat and get over here right this minute. It was here instead of here. Uh Uh-oh. Byron started walking toward Mama in slow motion, sliding his feet on the linoleum. He pulled off his hat and stood there looking down like his shoes were all of a sudden real interesting. Byron's head was covered with a blue and white handkerchief. Mama sucked in a ton of air. What have you done? We all knew, though. She took a step back and leaned against the counter like if it wasn't there, she'd fallen down. Oh my God, your father will kill you. He don't have no cause to. You've gone and done it, haven't you? Byron kept his head down. Haven't you? Mama yelled. Yes, Byron yelled back. Mama reached out and snatched the handkerchief off of Byron's head. Me and Mama both went, oh. Byron had gotten a conk, a process, a do, a butter, a ton of trouble. His hair was reddish brown, straight, Stiff and slick looking. Parts of it stuck straight up like porcupine stickers because Mama hadn't been too gentle when she snatched the handkerchief off. He smoothed his hair back in place. Well, Mama said, that's it. You are now at your daddy's mercy. You've known all along how we feel about putting those chemicals in your hair to straighten it. But you decided you are a grown man and went and did it anyway. Mama was real hot. But she surprised me. She just shook her head and went back to peeling potatoes. Byron stood there looking at his feet, and I kept pretending I was doing homework. Finally, Mama slammed the knife down and turned around to look at Bai again. Byron stood perfectly still while Mama walked around him a couple times, taking a better look at his hair. This looked like the Indians circling the wagons again, but this time it was Byron who had to be the white people. Finally, Mama stopped and said, But before your father gets to you, let me ask you something. What do you think? What do you think now that you've gone and done it? Does it make you look any better? Is this straight? Mama flicked some more Byron's hair back up porcupine style. Is this straight mess more attractive than your own hair? Did those chemicals give you better looking hair than me and your daddy and God gave you? It was strange. A little laugh was starting to get into Mama's voice. Huh, what do you think? Well, Bozo, she said, flicking a piece of Bai's hair out over his left ear and then another piece out over his right one. Maybe you were planning on joining the circus because you sure do look like an honest-to-God clown now. Mama was right. With big clumps of his hair sticking out to the side over his ears like that, He really did look like Bozo. I broke out laughing. 
But Byron shot me a real dirty look and I stopped and looked back down at my math book. I hated it when things like that happened and my head automatically went down by itself. Why on earth would you do this, Byron? I wanted Mexican style hair. I don't see nothing wrong with it. When he saw mama just looking sad and me looking like I wanted to crack up again, Byron got kind of mad and said, I think it's cool. Well, daddy cool, you enjoy your Mexican style hair while you can, because I'm sure when your daddy gets through with you, you won't be enjoying too much of anything. And cool is the one thing you won't be feeling. You just slide your cool self right on up those stairs to your bedroom and wait for him, daddy-o. Byron clomped up the stairs. I told Joey about what happened as soon as our next door neighbor, Mrs. Davison, brought her home from Sunday school. Me and Joey went up to see Byron. Byron was on the top bunk with his feet dangling over the side and his hands covering his face. I love times like this when Byron was about to really get it and couldn't pay me back for teasing him. I started in on him as soon as me and Joey got into the room. Death row prisoner number 541. You have a visitor. Please make this a short visit, ma'am. The priest will be here any minute to give the prisoner his last meal and his last cigarette. Oops, I forgot. No cigarettes for you, 541. You've been banned from ever looking at matches. Remember? Byron was feeling very sad. He didn't say anything to me. He didn't even give me a dirty look. That made me a lot braver. When she saw his hair, Joetta's eyes got real big and her voice got all choky. Byron Watson, what were you thinking about? Look at your head. Daddy's going to kill you. Come down from there. Let's go to the bathroom and wash that stuff out of your hair before Daddy gets here. Byron raised his slick down head from his hands. Go away, Joey. Come on, Byron. We got to wash your hair till that junk comes out. Hurry. Joetta pulled on Byron's dangling legs. Stop, Joey, he finally said. This don't wash out. It's got to grow out. You mean you have to keep it like that until it comes back normal? Yeah, Byron said, kind of smiling. They can't do nothing to it till it grows back. Oh, no. Daddy's going to tear you up. I said, that's right, ma'am. 541 is just waiting for the executioner to get home. Would you like to stick around and write down his last words? Joey turned and snapped. Why is this so funny to you, Kenny? Her eyes looked real mean. Who knows what daddy's going to do to him? Byron's hands came back up to cover his face. I said to Joey, why are you yelling at me? It wasn't me who went and got a butter and no one forced him to do it either. It makes me sick the way she's always protecting Byron. She turned back to him. Who did this to you, Bye? She didn't have to ask. There was only one other 14-year-old in the neighborhood who had a conk. I answered for him. It was Buphead. Why'd you let him, Bi? I told you to go away, Joey. No, Byron. Why'd you let him do this? Because I wanted to. That's why. But didn't you know Mommy and Daddy would find out? Shoot, you think I care what them squares say? I said, and there you have it, ma'am. The reason 541 must die. He won't confess his guilt. Byron looked at me for the first time and I started easing toward the door. He said, you think I don't know what you're doing, punk? You think I don't know you're loving all this mess? But I've been expecting this. This is just like that show I've seen about wolves. They said that the top dog wolf is always getting challenged by jive little wolves. They said the top dog wolf can't show no weakness at all. That if he do, if he gets hurt or something, If he steps on a broke bottle and starts limping or something, all the little jive wolves in the pack start trying to overthrow him. That's what's happening right now. You think I'm hurt, and you and every other punk chihuahua in America is climbing out of the woodwork to try to get a bite out of me. Let me tell you something. When we all heard the squeal of a car's brakes outside, Joey and I ran over to the bedroom window that looked out to the street. The brown bomber had just parked in front of the house. Joey started blubbering. Byron's legs dangled faster and faster. Dad got out of the brown bomber. I pretended I was holding a 
Buggle and started playing that Day is Done song that they play at funerals. <laughs> Byron, why won't you behave? Why won't you think about what's going to happen to you when you do something wrong? Why do you always do stuff to get people mad at you? Joey asked. Why don't you make a break for it, 541? I asked. We listened to the noises of dad coming home from work, the clump, clump of his boots coming off and being dropped in the closet by the front door, the whoosh in his chair, the whoosh his chair made when he sat in it. Dad saying, whew, it sure is good to be home. The second whoosh of the chair when mama sat in his lap, the sounds of kisses and giggles and laughs, then the words we waited for from dad. So what's new on the home front, Mrs. Watson? Oh, not much. They're surprised that one of your little darlings has for you, though. Good or bad? Hmm, well, I guess it depends on your point of view. Let me guess, which one of the crumb crushers is going to surprise Big Daddy today? Your first one. Oh, Lord, what'd he do? How serious this time? It can't be too bad. You seem pretty calm. Well, let's just say I'm numb. That bad? It depends. If you were happy with your son the way he was, this might be pretty bad. However, if you've always wanted a child from south of the border, you might be happy with the new young Mr. Watson. Okay, what's up? Let me put it this way. Do you remember the line Big Daddy used to give every girl at Central High School? Hmm, can't say I do. It goes like this. I can show you better than I can tell you. Ring any bells? Oh yeah, that does seem kind of familiar. Well, now's as good a time as any. Show me. All right, you asked for it. Byron, dear, could you please come down here for a minute? Mama didn't even raise her voice. She knew we'd be been listening to everything they were saying. Byron took a deep breath, then jumped off the top bunk and started down the stairs. I followed right behind him, pretending I was a reporter. I shoved an imaginary microphone in his face. Any famous last words, 541? Anything to say to all the little chihuahuas before they start coming out of the woodwork? Do you think the governor might call before they pull the switch? Are you going to come clean and tell what led you down the road to crime? I figured he didn't have anything to lose, so when we got about halfway down the steps, he popped me square in the ear, hard. Getting hit when you're not expecting it can really shake you up. My legs started wobbling like my knees were made out of jello. My eyes started leaking water. My nose started running. I tried to go tell on by, but all I could do was sit on the next to the last step and hold my ear as tears jumped out of my eyes. My throat wouldn't quit jerking up and down and making weird noises. Joy sat on the step next to me with tears jumping out of her eyes, too. When Byron walked into the living room, Mama said, Mr. Watson, I'd like to introduce you to your long-lost son from Mexico City, Senor Byron Cito Watson. Joey made me quit sobbing so we could see what Dad was going to do. But for the longest time, there were no sounds from the living room. We looked at each other. Finally, the chair whooshed as Mama got off of Dad's lap, then whooshed again as Dad stood up. After a long time, Dad said, Uh, 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 Ben? Well, son, what can I say? It's pretty much permanent, isn't it? Dad's voice was real calm, and that was scarier than if he'd been yelling. Yes, Dad. Yes, Dad, so there's really nothing I can do, is there? I don't think so, Dad. You don't think so, Dad. Well, judging by the condition of your hair, I wouldn't say thinking is one of your strong suits, is it? Byron mumbled something. Wow, he must have really felt like he didn't have anything to lose because Mama and Dad just didn't tolerate mumbling. Dad's voice shifted. Excuse me? I said, no, dad. No, dad. Joey started boohooing again. Whenever dad repeated everything you said like this, some real big trouble was about to follow. Hmm, you know, maybe there is something that can be done about this after all. Suddenly, dad and Byron were in the doorway leading upstairs. 
Dad looked surprised to see me and Joey sitting there. He smiled at us. Hi, Kenneth. Hi, Pumpkin. Why are you two crying? I could just point in my ear, but Joey said, Oh, Daddy, please, what are you going to do? Don't worry, Joe. Everything's okay. You just wait down here. Dad and Byron disappeared into the bathroom and the door locked behind them. Dad hadn't told me to wait downstairs, so I ran up and stood at the bathroom door peeking through the keyhole. Someone had stuffed some toilet paper in the hole, though, so I had to drop to the floor and peek under the door to see what was going on. From the way Dad and Bai's feet were standing, I could tell that Bai was sitting on the toilet and Dad was standing at the sink. Dad was rumbling around in the medicine cabinet. I could hear Bai sniff a couple of times. Then Dad started whistling that stupid song, Straighten Up and Fly Right. Dad's feet took the two steps from the sink to the toilet. Byron said, oh man, I heard a choo chicka sound and the floor around their feet started being covered with stiff, reddish brown, Mexican style hair. Dad kept whistling and cutting, choo chicka. Oh man, hold your head still. I hate to take one of these ears off by mistake. Dad went on whistling, choo chicka. Oh man. Kenneth, what are you doing? Mama called me from downstairs. I ran from the door and got halfway down the steps before I said, nothing, Mama. Come on down here and do nothing. Yes, Mama. What's your father doing? He's whistling straighten up and fly right and cutting all of Byron's hair off. Mama laughed. Joey sat next to her, still looking worried. The three of us sat on the couch for about half an hour before we heard Bai scream as loud as he could. Dad hollered down to us, just a little aftershave. We heard the bathroom door open. Dad came down the steps first. Mrs. Watson, he said, I'd like to introduce you to your long lost son from Siam, his royal highness, Yul Watson. Byron stepped into the living room with a real mean scowl on his face. Not only had dad cut off all of Byron's hair, he also shaved his head. Bai's head was so shiny it looked like it was wet. And Mrs. Watson, Dad said, you can't possibly deny this is your child. You can tell this boy has got a ton of sand's blood in him. Look at those ears. Poor Byron. If he had known how far his ears stuck out to the side, I bet he would have never gotten that butter. Mama put her hand over her mouth and said, Lord, don't blame that on my side of the family. Someone switched this child at the hospital. Joey laughed because she was relieved Byron hadn't been executed. Mama and Dad laughed at Byron, at Byron's ears, but none of them laughed as hard as me. Go get the broom and dustpan and sweep that garbage in the bathroom up. Then go stay in your room. This is it, Bye. You're old enough now and you've been told enough. This time, something's going to be done. Now beat it. Dad's forehead was all wrinkled when he said this. They sent me and Joey outside so they could have one of those adult-only talks. When me and Joey drifted back into the house after what seemed enough time for them to talk, Dad was on the telephone. He was holding the receiver away from his ear and making a funny face. I could hear someone yelling from the phone. Dad whispered to Mama, Why does she think she's got to yell on a phone for a long-distance call? Mama slapped his arm and whispered back, You leave my mama alone. They were talking to Grandma Sands all the way in Alabama. Me and Joey crowded up next to them on the couch and heard Grandma Sands yell, This is costing y'all a fortune, Daniel. Let me talk to my baby again. Dad handed the phone back to Mama, then dug his finger around in his ear like he was going deaf. Mama gave Dad a dirty look and said, Okay, Mama, we'll be getting back with you. We love you. Bye-bye. She said this stuff Southern style. And that was it. We thought that was the end of Byron's latest adventure until a week later when Dad brought home the TTAB 700 in the Brown Bomber. All right, that's the end of Chapter 7. I will read you Chapter 8 tomorrow. We may even dig into Chapter 9. So come back, tune in, and listen to the chapters. Talk to you later.